This is Auto Line After Hours, unscripted, uncensored, unapproved. Are you a podcast kind of person? Then look for Auto Line After Hours wherever you go for your favorite podcast. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey. Gary Vasilash, last show of the year, man. Yeah, it's hard to believe, isn't it? Another year gone. Yikes, yikes. It, it, it flew by quick. But, you know, when you start to think back over what happened during the year, a lot happened. And that's what we want to talk about today. Absolutely. We've got a, we've got a stellar cast that will help us uh, unravel what happened in 2022. And, and here they come. They're making their appearance. David Welch from Bloomberg, Henry Payne from the Detroit News, and Jamie Butters from Automotive News. Welcome aboard, hey, guys. Hey there, gentlemen. Good to be with you. <laughs> Season's greetings. Glad to be here. Thank you. Glad you yeah. guys are all here. So what we wanted to talk about is the best and worst of 2022. Look ahead to 2023. But Gary's got a great way to get their show started. Okay. So so here's what we're going to do, guys. Is So I made a list of the vehicles that were revealed, released, introduced each month of the year. And so... What I want you all to do is to comment on on these vehicles because I it, it surprised me um, because some of the things I had forgotten about and and so you'll sort of get the sense of of what what I'm what I'm saying here. So we'll just do round robins or if somebody has something want to say and somebody doesn't want to comment, that's that's fine too. So in January um, with CES, which has now become the de facto auto show, it seems. Um, th there were several introductions. So Mercedes came out with the EQXX, which they said has a 625 mile range. Chrysler did the airflow concept in EV. Sony announced that it was going to be getting into the auto industry. The Silverado EV was revealed. And then it was later on, it was introduced or noted that the Equinox and Blazer was going electric. So Let's start with the Mercedes. Is is this a game changer or was this just sort of a sort of thing that was like, gee whiz, look what our scientists can do and someday you'll go 625 miles on a Mercedes. Kick it off, Henry. Well, I, I've been in and out of Mercedes production cars in more recent months. Um, that, that CES, uh, I was not at CES. Uh, the CES launch seems a long time ago. I can tell you the, uh, the, the EQ... Uh, Mercedes are are, um, are are excellent vehicles. Uh, set the standard for the industries in, in in terms of interior, and I defer to the other guys in terms of the concept. Whether that's a game changer, I think it's hard for a concept to change the game. Uh, we'll see how uh, if they uh, come out with a 600 mile uh, range uh, Mercedes. But I totally uh, co-signed to what Henry said. I mean that EQS is a fantastic vehicle if you can afford one <laughs> yeah i would say look you know concept cars are great you know what was that little two-seater volkswagen came out with about a decade ago it was all carbon fiber had a little diesel in it got like some crazy fuel economy number like 200 miles to the gallon or something like that and they never made it. That that never hit production. Well, they made they made they made like a dozen of them, John. It was the XL one, I believe. XL one. There, there you go. Yeah, they. But I mean, it, it's it's about getting headlines. It's about forming a brand image, and I'm not opposed to that. But the EQXX is is a, I mean, it's an engineering marvel. But is it really going to show where Mercedes is headed? I'm not sure. Well, and will 600 miles of range show up? Um, I, I don't think getting huge range in an EV is very difficult if weight, cost, size is, is, are, are, are not obstacles. So <laughs> are they going to build this thing? Is it going to weigh you know, more than the, the Hummer EV? And <laughs> is it going to cost you know, $800,000? And also, no one's asking for that. I, I think if you can give car buyers, even luxury car buyers, 450 miles of range, which is what you get on a tank of gas, they're happy. No, I mean, look, if they can do 600, great. Uh, but no one's asking for that. So we'll see. Okay. So, so Chrysler, so Chrysler seems to have basically gone under the radar. I mean, the, the vehicles that it has in the Chrysler showroom, it's a good thing that most 
the land. The Pacifica the had a huge year, Gary. Huge year for Pacifica <laughs> sales. <laughs> well, one there, of their there, two models. <laughs> there, there is that, and uh, yeah, one of their two models. So, okay, so they come out with the airflow. So, John, I know that you, when you were at the introduction and and you talked to the Chrysler folks, um, is this the real deal? Is it, are we going to see something um, from Chrysler? Yeah, but not the airflow that they showed. I mean, what I learned and background is that when COVID hit, they, they had been working on that project. And when COVID hit, it kind of came to a stop. And then, you know, as we talked about last week on the show, uh, Stellantis was still trying to figure out its master plan of what it was going to do. So that concept that we saw at CES was actually already a couple of years old. And, you know, designers, they, if they're showing a concept, they want it to be the latest, greatest, hottest thing they got going, not something that's been sitting on the shelf for a couple of years. So my guess is we're going to see another version yet of the Airflow that is going to be a lot more edgier, a lot more modern looking. So, so do you guys think that we're going to see something from Chrysler or is Chrysler going to fade into the woodwork? Well, well no, again... Again, you know, again, uh, you know, given given how how quickly things are moving in this industry, uh, Gary, uh, within the Stellantis brand, uh, the the Dodge uh, Cha uh, Charger Daytona sucked all the air out of the room through its uh, rear pipe organ. I mean, I, I uh, who who remembers the Chrysler Airflow uh, after Dodge dropped that EV bomb? So all these brands. Um, are, are really trying to establish uh, halos. Mercedes has done that with the, with the EQE. Here comes Dodge. And uh, so I, I, I think uh, Chrysler is, is more lost than ever in the uh, Stellantis universe uh, because uh, clearly that brand or clearly that company is, uh, is looking at halos uh, from Dodge and, and Alpha, which is going to have a slew of EV product here in the ne next couple of years. Um, I, Chrysler just looks more lost than ever. Bring back the 300 C. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're looking at a year of an continued inflation. Inflation's come down, but prices are high. Interest rates are high. We're, we're going to see, you know, there's recession possibilities. I, I think when car companies start to face all of that, they start to take a harder look at some of their marginal brands and some of these automotive curios that, that they showed off. And, you know, if I look at the, the whole group of Stellantis brands, you know, the American side is basically Jeep Ramco. Um, so why, why do they, why would they do anything for the Chrysler brand? The Dodge brand still kind of has the space as, you know, doing some niche sports cars. Um, and you can have a lot of fun with those with electric drive, but I don't know. This, this seems as a very nice to have and, absolutely unnecessary and as money gets tight the economy shows risk projects like that just get get you know left on the cutting room floor the the one thing i would throw out there i mean uh, carlos Tavares has said he's going to give all of the brands all 14 brands a 10-year runway um and try to let them all have some sort of ev offering to find a way into the future uh i mean the the challenge for Chrysler, right? It's not really a premium brand. It's not really, a, you know, a, a star mainstream brand. Uh, but I do think they've got some technology that can maybe bring some costs down. And if they can get enough scale, maybe sharing with Peugeot uh, that could maybe make that Chrysler airflow or whatever the actual crossover ends up being, uh, it could be competitive. We'll, you know, we'll see what, what they can do. What else you got, Gary? Okay, so so let's so so okay. We know what you think about this, John. So we're going to keep you out of this one, okay? <laughs> so so there, there's this ongoing debate that we have, and, and and John's a big fan of the of the Silverado EV that the strategy is clean sheet versus the Ford Lightning, which you know as you guys know is is basically a retrofitted F one fifty with um, electric power put in it. So. General Motors comes out in, in January and announces the Silverado EV, and then it announces the Equinox and Blazer going electric, and it's talking about a $30,000 price point for, for the Equinox. Um, so, so two questions to you guys. One is, is the General Motors strategy, which John thinks is genius, is, is that the way to go, or does Ford have something 
more clever by saying, hey, let's get something out there quickly. And secondly, will we ever see an electric vehicle that costs $30,000 that has reasonable range to go back to the range, David, that we were talking about before? So those are the two questions. Okay. So look, everyone is going to do what GM is doing with Ultium in some form, right? They're going to work on dedicated EV platforms. It's how Tesla makes EVs. Volkswagen has a platform like this. Everyone else is going to do it. GM got work done on this pretty early, so I think it's pretty smart. Um, you know, yeah. did, did, does Ford have a better strategy? Look, at the end of the day, the consumer doesn't care, right? I, I think someone wants to buy an electric F-150 or they want to buy an electric Silverado. They're going to buy it because they like the truck and they're loyal to those brands and pickup buyers are loyal to brand uh, more so than most. So the, the vehicles will sell on their merits. I, I think where GM has helped out here is they can get to scale very quickly, making many more, many more offerings and presumably getting more volume. And, and by the way, having their battery plants up and running before others do. So the advantage of Ultium, there, there's no magic in the chemistry that gives them great range or performance. And you know, there, there's nothing really special about it other than it's a great industrial strategy. It's gonna be invisible to the consumer, I think. Uh, and I think everyone's gonna do something similar to it. So, you know, kudos to GM for getting out early on this, but kudos to Ford for getting all the buzz and getting out there first with an electric pickup truck. I mean, it, it's there's a tortoise and hare thing going on. In five years, we won't even be talking about it. Bingo. You know, I I totally. I mean, you know, Ford is doing the same thing, but they did the they did the <clears throat> modified EVs first, right? With the Mach E and the and the Lightning. But they're working on an F series that is going to be you know some sort of a skateboard or a hybrid type of a skateboard platform. GM has a. GM has great confidence in their strategy. Um, it has potential and will, uh, I, I can't wait to see how it, how it plays out. And, and I mean, I'm curious, I mean, the Bolt, I know you're talking about, you know, the nice range on the Ultiums and, and that's, uh, looks like really cool battery technology and good platforms. But you start talking about a Bolt that's under $3,000 or under $30,000 and might qualify for $7,500 in tax credits, at least for the first quarter. That's a steal. You know, the Bolt EUV is one of the best buys on, on the market, considering that the average new vehicle sells for around 48000 You can get, I mean, the EUV, the, the regular Bolt is sort of like, looks like a running sneaker and has no room inside. The EUV's roomier, looks better, and you're getting, what, 260, 265 miles of range, and it starts at under 30. And yeah, like Jamie says, put that tax credit on there. It is an, actually a terrific buy out there if somebody wants an EV, if you want any kind of vehicle, really. But I, I, I tell you, the interesting thing about the the uh, Chevy Bolt EUV is the only people that I know who own them are still um, are, are still a, a rich demographic, and I, I think the uh, what the EV what the what the Bolt EV is telling us, and what the uh, the Ford uh, Lightning is telling us is that EVs are a luxury niche, and I and I think the uh, the Lightning. Uh, because it was it, it was first it was uh, from a branding perspective it was brilliant because Ford uh, you know Ford's number one in the truck space and so they come out with the first uh, uh, full size truck and uh, that 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 uh, helps their that that brand uh, image versus the other two uh, uh, truck automakers but also as people have gotten into that Lightning they're learning it's a niche vehicle it cannot tow I mean uh, the the bulk of the of the of the of the pickup market tows and so this this is a country club uh, a pickup truck that can't go 100 miles tow you can't go you can't go between superchargers on i-75 towing 5,000 pounds behind you on a ford f-150 lightning and so i think the lightning accelerated um the the realization that evs are for the 20 percent of the market that's, that's luxury and and um so you know uh, uh going forward um, I, I think the quicker band, brands realize that. Uh, I think they've generally, they, uh, GM certainly has realized that. They're not making uh, a $30,000 bolt anymore. I mean, that thing's on fire sale. The Ultium, all the Ultium stuff is north of $50,000 uh, now, including a, a, a Chevy Blazer SS, which is going to be like a $60,000 uh, SUV. So they're realizing that the income demographic that buys EVs 
are multi-car garages, single-family homes um, that, uh, that that use that vehicle as a niche vehicle. So uh, for GM, is Ultium strategy? I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, that sounds like that's a mass production strategy, whereas the market is realizing this is a niche. Uh, I think GM uh, sells Ultium to Honda, and they make a lot of money, you know, doing uh, partnerships and whatnot. But I, I think it calls into question uh, uh, corporations like GM that are putting all their all their eggs in one basket. Okay, so so you you brought up Honda. Um, so so John, we'll start with you since I kept you from <laughs> rhapsodizing, right. ra- rhapsodizing about how uh, General Motors strategy is, is brained on the, uh, the the Eltingham thing. So so Sony announced that it's going to be getting into the auto industry, and we subsequently learned that it is going to be getting into the auto industry working with Honda. So my question is, why the hell? Would any company want to get into the auto industry right Well, now? you know, same reason that we've heard all these rumors Apple wants to get into it. I mean, in the tech industry, automotive is hot. and, and But it's the new automotive, right? It's the promise of autonomy, but even closer than that, connectivity. I mean, and entertainment in cars. And as you need to do less and less driving as more and more of this autonomous features comes on, in-car entertainment is going to be king and shopping as well. You know, a whole bunch of things coming on. And uh, I think Sony sees that it can play a role in all that. And that's why it wants to get involved. Same with Apple. Jamie. You know, it's a, it's a tough one because it's a, it's such a crowded and competitive field, but look, everybody wants to, there is the more, more, automotive startups now than there have been in a hundred years. And it's because of Tesla. Right. And they all think that because Elon Musk, you know, raised the tens of billions of dollars he needed to get past the money losing stage that he's like created this path. And all they need to do is come up with an EV and they can just march right down the road and collect all the billions from all the investors who are too stupid to know that the vehicles, most vehicles don't make money. So, you know, there's a big rush. We see all these EV startups, some of whom have already failed and many more will fail. You know, Sony is an interesting brand and Honda, you know, has a long, (laughs) Honda's behind on EVs. They're using GM to try to get them back into the game or to, to buy them time until they can develop solid state batteries and technology of their own that will really make them competitive, you know, sometime in the next decade. I, I don't expect a Sony car to, to light the world on fire anytime soon, but in a, in a market that is very much in flux, it could happen. So David, you're the business week guy. Does, does a Sony car even pencil? Um, well, we don't really know exactly what Sony's going to do. Right. I mean, they're going to partner uh, with, with Honda. I mean, so do they just, take part in this. I mean, we've all been waiting for the Apple car to show up. I think we're still waiting for the Apple TV to show up. And, you know, everyone thought there was going to be an Apple television hanging on your wall with slick Apple design and great features. And what they instead gave us was a bunch of content. They may yet make an automobile, uh, but I don't know. I've talked to consultants who have done work for a lot of U.S. technology companies. And all these companies look at, you know, whatever, what is it, 1.4 trillion a year or whatever it is in new car sales and think, why can't we get a chunk of that? Um, And then they look at the margins and the capital required and everything else. And they say, I see why we don't want to bother trying to get a chunk of that. Um, So I'm not convinced that, I mean, Sony may play a role in providing some cool technology and content, but I don't think they're going to get into actual automaking. Dyson looked at it, took a sniff and walked away. Apple still hasn't come up with anything. Um, And, you know, let's, quickly talk about the startups if if we're talking about a bonfire of capital. Um, So Rivian raised, I think, $23 billion. Lucid has raised a little over eight. All of the other EV startups combined have raised $6 billion. So, you know, they don't have long odds of making it. Sony can certainly raise money if they wanted to do this, but I'm seeing a joint venture where they provide some cool technology uh, and, and, you know, join at the hip with Honda. But I don't know that we're going to see a Sony branded vehicle with an emblem on the hood driving down the road. Hmm. 
Anything, Henry, or just yeah? Well, I, I, but I, you know, we we are. Uh, this is an, a second industrial revolution going on with this extraordinary uh, electronic and uh, and battery innovation going on. So it's I think it's just exciting to see uh, what has been a legacy industry uh, attracting startups. I mean, that's an extraordinary story. You got the most startups in this industry in a hundred years, and 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 it's also interesting to to see where those startups are going. I mean, we. That because they're in the retail space, Lucid and Rivian get the headlines. But you got two truck makers uh, that are in that are in this uh, industry, Lordstown and Bollinger, that aren't interested in retail at all. They're 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 going after the commercial market. They see an opportunity uh, in the commercial market. And Bollinger is a really fascinating uh, case. Uh, um, uh, John John and I interviewed the founder a number of years ago, uh, coming into. Uh, uh, Detroit setting up a shop here. That that business has evolved dr drastically to to a, a class three and above. I think John, uh, a truck maker, uh, because they found that their niche for for trucks, uh, with at least the capital they had, was in commercial. It's not in uh, retail. I was just out in uh, uh, San Francisco driving around in a uh, in a cruise. Uh, uh, Chevy Bolt, uh, because GM uh, is, is very aggressive about autonomous uh, cars. And there was a company out there called Zooks driving around on the streets in Jaguar I Paces. I never heard of Zooks until I went out to San Francisco. So, you know, the, the, there's, there's startups uh, all over the place in this industry, and, it's, and it's, it's fascinating for them to look at. And I think big legacy companies, whether you're GM or Sony, you got to pay attention, otherwise you might get uh, you might miss uh, the next big thing. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip the Alpha Tonnel, which was introduced in February, and go on to the final introduction of the VW ID Buzz. Okay, so the 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 the, the van that that I know Jamie has been waiting for with bated breath. Um, so, so the fortunes of, gen or of of Volkswagen in the U.S. in terms of EVs is is not what they thought it would be. Is is this going to be the salvation of the EV for Volkswagen in the United States? I I mean I I'm I'm ex I am excited about it. I had we had a bus when I was a a, a kid, and it was it was a great van. But one of the met part of the magic of the old VW bus, like the old VW Beetle, the original, you know, was they were very cheap very cheap to make they could sell them cheap you know they clearly have a cost problem or they would have brought this out you know years ago uh to john's point about the airflow and the how long that design sat around they've been showing this this bus concept for for years now and and they know there's demand they know there are people who love it who love the idea but if you're going to bring it out and it's going to have to cost sixty thousand dollars or something to cover the costs well, then you're not going to have that market, right? If if it's a thirty thousand uh, dollar electric van, you could sell you know hundreds of thousands of them, and if it's a sixty thousand dollar van, you know, you're going to sell maybe thousands. Hmm. Jamie's right. This this concept of the VW bus coming back is old enough to shave. Um, <laughs> you know, could an electric look? It looks really cool. I just some sort of halo or nostalgia vehicle is not going to set the heather away for Volkswagen in the U.S. They, they've got, it's not a bad brand. It's not a damaged brand, but they have a brand problem. When it was a niche brand, what they sold was German engineering at a more accessible price than BMW did, but it was still a premium over Toyota, Honda, and, and the domestics. Then they had, you know, it was, Stefan Jacoby was running it. They wanted to go for volume. They built the plant in Tennessee. They lowered prices decontented the cars, they went toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and the hardcore fans said it's no longer the Volkswagen I used to pay a premium for, and the cars weren't good enough to, to wedge people out of Hondas, Toyotas, and some of the domestic vehicles. So, you know, their, their real issue is, what does it stand for in the United States? And how do you pull people out of other brands when they're pretty happy with what they've got? And I, I do think that electric vehicles generally give companies a chance to reset the market share tables. Uh, I, I think the Koreans are going to pull that trick. GM is hoping it will with Ultium. And it could. It certainly has for Tesla. Um, 
so if, if I think the way Volkswagen can do it is the if, if if there's the inflection point GM says is here, where even mass market buyers want to go electric, and Volkswagen gets out a bunch of them, and they do have a platform in the works like all team, and you know they can they can possibly gain share, but it's still like I don't think one vehicle just you know turns this this whole thing upside down for them. Yeah, and look but, what happened when they brought the Beetle back uh, about 20 years ago or so. Everybody loved it. Everybody flipped out. It was a North American car of the year. It got headlines everywhere. And then in about two years, everybody who wanted that bought it. And that was the end of it. I mean, sales slowly just dropped year after year after year after that. And nobody in Europe wanted it. They thought, you know, the Americans are crazy wanting a retro car like this. So I, I think the ID buzz is really cool. I think it's likely to suffer the same fate as the Beetle did unless they do something really different in terms of pricing, in terms of packaging. But if it's if it's uh, just cool looking, it's a niche and it's not going to go beyond that. But, you know, and, and John, but it, uh, look at what the ID buzz tells you about uh, where this EV market is. I mean, the, the VW is a brand that was built on the bug and the bus. These these uh, every man vehicles, everybody could afford them. And here they come into the, the EV space, same brand uh, with the ID4 and the ID buzz, which they which they claim to be their new bug and bus, obviously. They are they are they are priced well out of 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 where the uh, the average consumer is, even before you get to the livability of an of, of an EV, you know, having to put a charger into your home and all that sort of thing. So, uh, I, I think that's uh, that's a telling thing right there that uh, VW sees its future in forty and sixty thousand dollar ID four and ID buzzes, not uh, it, it what what built that brand, which was uh, entry level bugs and and buses. Okay, in April, we saw the Lincoln Star concept. Lincoln has been sort of quiet uh, for the last year or so. Um, what do you guys make of their saying, okay, we're going to become an all-electric brand as well, and, and here's this, this really wizard-looking vehicle that we have that will bring us there? You know, did, did they even make one? Isn't everything that they revealed CG, computer-generated? I'm not even sure if they made that concept car. They had two cool concepts that on the on the floor in Detroit. They didn't have a press conference, but they did have a couple of cool concepts there. I think that was one. I of think them. it was a star. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but and, and wasn't it done in China too? Look, here's the thing, Lincoln. To me, it feels very much like Buick in that it's a brand that really exists in the U.S. in order to protect its credibility in China. Uh, Lincoln's future is going to be one in China or it's not going to have one. And uh, the same is true for Buick. And Buick is also trying to go all electric. I don't blame them. You got to try to do something to jumpstart that brand. But are you really, I mean, they don't even have a hybrid right now, do they? I mean, they certainly don't have an electric. They're going to have their first one out in 2024. They want dealers to commit three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars to uh, an all electric Buick brand for 2030. I don't know where, where does that brand fit in the world? What's the psychographic for that brand? And I, and I'm afraid Lincoln's in kind of the same spot. They've done a lot of work to really improve the way they treat their customers and add some, some nice luxury touches. But I, I just don't know that they're winning over enough, you know, converts or that they have a chance to win over enough converts to really make that a strong brand again. You know, Jamie, I mean, you bring up uh, Buick. I know uh, uh, Gary started this conversation with the uh, the Lincoln, but doesn't Bu Buick actually has made big strides with consumers uh, as it went to an SUV brand um, and it, it became relevant to people again. It wasn't a uh, octogenarian sedan brand anymore. Uh, refreshed itself with uh, new badges and all that. Doesn't it make, more, doesn't it make sense uh, for Buick to continue as a premium ICE brand, and then let the luxury customers go to Cadillac. I, I, I'm, I'm a little mystified. I mean, I, I'm a little mystified why every luxury brand is on this rush to be all electric. It seems to me if, if that Buick fits a perfect niche 
uh, in between mainstream and, and radical luxury celest celestic all electric Cadillac by sticking with ICEs and hybrids. Because right now, I, I think electric has captured the imagination of luxury bikes. And the way they're priced, they are luxury vehicles. Henry brought that up early on. I don't think that that's going to last forever. I don't even think it's going to last a few more years. I, I think as range gets better, prices come down, assuming they can come down with commodities market issues, which we can get into later. Um, and and we, you know, you know, people learn more about how you're going to live with your EV. It's not just going to be a luxury vehicle, but for the moment it is. So every luxury brand is going electric. If you don't have, right now, if you don't have an electric story as a luxury brand, you're you're in trouble. So I think that's why Lincoln's doing that. Certainly why Cadillac has announced it's going to go all electric and everybody else is doing it too. Tesla ate everybody's lunch. I mean, they basically decimated the luxury sedan market by by selling Teslas. I mean, the five series, all you know, E Class, those cars, they lost a lot of market share to Tesla with the Model S and eventually the Y. Yeah. Hey, look, good stuff. We got to take a quick commercial break and we'll come back to talk about more things. How do Bridgestone tires stop shorter on wet roads? It's their hydro track technology. But you don't have to know how the science works, just where the brake is. What really matters is their Bridgestone. All right, we're back. All right, so, 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 so Jamie preempted the buick so we won't talk about the buick wildcat which came out in june beautiful um, though I, a beautiful concept that's so, i just want to say that at least they oh. have a, like lincoln they have a beautiful concept for their potential evs someday yeah and, well and, if car companies built those concept cars everything would be great <laughs> but they never do <laughs> we couldn't afford them if they built them but yes uh it would be awesome okay so so we've we've mentioned this brand and, and Henry you just brought it up. Um so we we officially got to drive the Cadillac Celestique. Or no, we didn't get to drive this. I, I was thinking the lyric, sorry. So the so the Cadillac Celestique came out and, and John, you did a show that was that was all about the Celestique and, and, and what it's all about. Um and, and what is the number, the price that this is going to be retailing for? All they'll admit to is over three hundred thousand, but I've had other sources tell me. It's going to be more like three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand by the time you get it done with. So, so Jamie, you're at Automotive News, and you know lots and lots and lots about dealerships. Um, are are there lots of dealers that are going to be positioned well to be able to sell a three hundred thousand plus vehicle? No, they won't even. I mean, they're only going to have a many. They won't even have one per dealer. I don't think. Uh, so, it's, uh, I don't even is, think these are going through dealers. You know, I mean. Nominally, they will, right? But no, but you're... nominally in the United States, they will. Uh, right. In the rest of the world, it, it's going to be a direct sale. But with all the, um, you know, with all of the customization you can do, that's it is kind of a could be kind of a messy thing online, uh, you know. But yeah, it's it's just such a low volume thing. You, it, the the dealer model is kind of irrelevant for uh, the Celestic. Hmm. So but David the lyric, can... but the lyric, I mean, the, the thing is to maybe get it on some magazine covers, get people to say, oh, really? Cadillac, electric, huh? And then, you know, and then try to sell them the lyric, which, you know, looks like a good car. So, so David, does, does the Cadillac brand support a vehicle at that price point? I mean, you remember when, when Mercedes brought Maybach back because they figured, right. well, we, we need to have something that is above it. And then, of course, that didn't work out so very well for them. And now it's Mercedes hyphen Maybach. Historically, it could. Uh, I think it was the Eldorado Brougham, I think, in the late 50s or late 60s. I, I looked it up for a column I wrote about it, and it was priced just below a Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud. So there was a time when Cadillac could do it. Um, that time is long past. I think they'll sell some of these. Uh, I don't know. I think, John, you and I may have debated this, and I've debated it with Paul Eisenstein, and I think both of you thought that this will do a lot for Cadillac. Um, Look, they, they might even make some money on these. I, I really don't see it elevating the brand. It's it's kind of a question that one might have asked 15 years ago. Um, so I, I don't think it turns the brand around. I, I think the fact that it's unique and I think it will be well done, it looks cool, uh, will get some people to pay that kind of money for it in the kind of numbers one might sell a $350,000 vehicle. 
Um, I mean, what brand supports that other than Rolls Royce and, you know, Ferrari uh, and, and some of the real super sports cars that sell for that kind of money? I mean, you're, you're talking very small number of brands that sell, sell a very small number of vehicles. Yeah. But, that, you know, David, doesn't that speak to how radical Cadillac sees this transformation? I mean, these th this company, you know, this company is making big bets and Cadillac is one of them. Mm -hmm. They're going all electric by 2030. And that's interesting, the history of the Brogham that you bring up. Uh, I mean, this this is a brand that clearly covets those days. And once they, they get back, could change the game for them is the lyric. I mean, I've sat in the car. I've been around I mean, it, it. Very yeah, but, good design. It's the interior is what Cadillac should have been doing for the last 20 years while while they tried to make a comeback about six times. Yeah. Um, but 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 doing but doing a, a Celestic is that's that's a coach builder. You bring up. I mean, that that's a that's a very different business model. And uh, so for Cadillac to go there with the Celestic uh I mean, it's just tells me how 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 radical they're they're trying to rethink that brand. I mean, well, they are. They, I, I kind of give them credit. For but them. do they do they stick with it? Right. I mean, uh, that's that's always the question with Cadillac. Do you stick with it? But that's a I mean, that's a radical change for your brand, for your halo, not to be an Escalade, but to be a a a custom made Rolls Royce, essentially. You know, it looks ill timed right now because the stock market is uh is in shambles and we're not seeing a lot of dot-com billionaires coming out of the woodwork but if um you know that's really who it's for right it's the the uber rich who can throw around throw away you know half a million dollars on a car uh because it's fun and they need toys uh but if you know it in, in a recession that's not going to be a, as great of a business but yeah it's a it's an exciting effort it's an exciting effort well, look, Cadillac's got to do something to boost its image amongst luxury buyers. You know, Bob Lutz talked about this years ago. He says, if you pull up into the country club with a Mercedes or a BMW, nobody asks any questions. If you pull up in a Cadillac, they ask, why'd you buy a Cadillac? And he said, you know, if you show up in a V-Series, they go, oh, yeah, I understand that, why you got a V-Series. But he said, Cadillac customers have to explain why they bought their car. And that's what the Celestic is all about, is, is coming out with this uber luxury, super rare, low volume vehicle that and it's going to take years for it to become known. And it's still never going to be as well known as, say, like Rolls Royce or Bentley, because they've been around 100 years. But that's what the Celestic is about. It's not even about making money. You know, if if General Motors makes twenty five million dollars in profit a year off that brand, it should declare victory. It's about changing brand image, and, and that's going to be measured literally by in years, decades, probably. But John, how does this idea of Celestic reach the great, the larger luxury market to tell people this brand is back? I mean, how, like, how does that get communicated so that the person who could can't afford that but can afford an eighty thousand uh, dollar, you know, loaded up? Actually, I don't think the lyric gets that high, but let's say a 70, $60,000 $70, lyric or a $100,000 Escalade. Are those people even aware of what the Celestic is going to be? No, that's why I said it's going to take years. It, it, it's going to be at concours events or maybe they're on a vacation at a nice resort and one happens to pull up or something like that. Um, it, it, it's a multi-part of the Cadillac approach. It, and Celestic's at the very tip of that, you know, the tip of the spear as they talk about it, but it, it's going to take other things. And, and Lyric is where it's really going to happen in terms of changing brand image around and getting out first with an electric car. And, and as Henry points out right now, it's, it's people that are at the, you know, upper end of uh, uh, income that are going to go into electrics. That's where Cadillac's going to have uh have an opportunity to go after the established brands like Mercedes, BMW, and Audi. So um, I, I, I guess I should mention just to level set here, um, Rolls introduced the Spectre EV in October. So um, there's there's competition there. So I want to switch this up a little bit. Um, it's a sales race. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, so, so speaking of General Motors and, and its electric aspirations um 
KPMG came out with its 2023 Global Automotive Executive Survey. And the survey, uh, more than 900 executives, 30 countries, 252 of those surveyed, 252 of the 900 were the United States. And, and one of the things that caught my eye was that they asked these executives to say, okay, in 2030, what will be the top electric vehicle brands, okay? And so perhaps no surprise at number one with 233, two, 223 votes was Tesla, okay? Then it goes all the way down to Fisker at 34. So in second place is Audi, then BMW, Apple, Ford, Honda, BYD, Hyundai, Kia, Mercedes, Toyota, Baidu, and then Fisker. No General Motors. How do, how do you think that they feel in the Rensen right now when they're looking at this list? With so not Rensen. one GM brand got a single vote? Well, the, the, the number they cut it off at was 34. So um, there could be, but yeah, not there. You know, so I, there are 34 I just, names on that list. I, I want to know how many of those startups are on there because I, I, I don't think a lot of those are going to be alive by 2025. They're just not going to have the money. But not putting GM on, I, I, look, I, I don't know why they didn't. But you may not, you may think GM's not going to be on top of the list or in the top five with Chevy or Cadillac. But that, like, what you're telling us tells us that 230 something executives think GM's going to go out of business in the next seven years. You know, well, years so ago, Arthur Anderson used to do these studies uh, of executives in the auto industry all over the world. And they did them every two or three years. And I, I was very, very interested in them. But after a while, I came to realize all the latest study did was prove how wrong they were in the last study. <laughs> and, I, you know, so I'd like to see this study in a couple of years when GM gets a chance to really roll out its Ultium program and then see what they have to say. Gary, did you say that they 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 predicted Fisker Fisker had the second most votes for no F Fisker was at the bottom. Okay. So, so, so that was, I mean, just to give you the bandwidth of 223 executives thought that Tesla would be number one in 2030 and 34 I executives. I don't understand here. Sorry to interrupt, but so these are votes. This, this isn't a ranking of where, you know, given the voting where they, like a market share ranking. This is how many votes they got where they would have a brand that would be number one in EV market share. Right. So, so basically, so 223 said it would be Tesla, 206 said Audi, 196 BMW, 133 said Apple. Okay. Which, which goes back to the earlier discussion of, you know, Sony getting into this thing and then the presumed. So, so these guys still think that Apple's going to come out there. Um, you know, Ford is 128, Honda 106, BYD 101, Hyundai Kia 78, Mercedes 78, Toyota 55, Baidu 42, and then Fisker. 34. They're saying Honda in 2030. That's not even in their wildest dreams that they would have Honda any chance of being number one in any market in the world. Not even in Japan. I mean, all right. So let's 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 move on to another <laughs> finding. And this this I think, and this sort of goes to Henry's point. I think what he was talking about earlier. Okay. So now this is what they think the battery electric vehicle market, not hybrids, just pure BEVs, will be in 2030. Okay. So the average, and this is for for this year's results is is. 29%. Okay, so they think 29% of the US vehicle market in 2030 will be BEVs. Now here here's the kicker that I think is 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 very astonishing. Is that the is that new vehicles is that new vehicles sold, Gary? Or? Share of market. So oh, in markets? 2030 there'll be so 2030 when when Jamie's outfit does the sales they'll say okay, 29% of all these vehicles were electric vehicles. Okay. Okay. So the median number in 2022 was 35%. Okay. So the median said 35%, that would be the share of market. Last year, the 2021 results had it at 65%. So it's gone from 65%. So 
is 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 there some you know realization perhaps henry that these things are costing so much money that you're not going to be getting bigger shares of market yeah well, uh, uh, there's uh there's one of these studies that was done uh it wasn't kpmg it was another uh a uh, major outfit back in 2010 uh, uh, interviewed 200 top auto executives, and they said by 2020, 100% of the market will be hybrid. Uh, clearly, they got that wrong. But in 2010, that was that was the trend. That's what everybody was buzzing about. The Tesla Model S had not even been introduced in 2010 to 2012 uh, vehicles. So here we are in 2022. And you're asking these executives again, based on current trends. Um, I, I, I think uh, I, I, I think the, the most important statistic to look at, uh, and it and it and it uh, affects what you're talking about, going from 65% to 29%, uh, is that the the automakers have realized in the last couple of years that the demographic that uh, the EVs, EVs appeal to are is an upper demographic. That's why you're seeing automakers like Nissan not making, uh, getting out of the LEAF strategy and going to an Araya, which is a $45,000 uh, SUV. You're seeing GM going away from the Chevy Bolt strategy and going toward a, uh, you know, a, a $45,000, $60,000 Chevy Blazer strategy. And if, so if you look at that demographic, the, uh, the, the average, the luxury demographic in this country is 17% of sales nationally. Uh, it's 25% in California, which is the highest uh, percentage of luxury market. So um, I, I think that's I think that's what you're playing in, uh, at least until 2030. Um, and uh, so I, I I would I would say that the share of market will be under uh, 20%. I, I would guess it would be more like uh, 10 10 15%. By 2030? Yes. Oh. See, I, I see three times that. I'm, I'm saying one out of three vehicles by 2030 will be electric. Yeah. And I would say this, this survey where they go from 65% to 29% in one year's time shows this is a measure of their perceptions. They don't know what they're talking about. I mean, how could you possibly cut your forecast in half in one year, except that you're hearing all these things, oh, lithium prices are going up and there's all these other issues. Uh, look, I mean... EV development is not sitting still. You know, I just uh, was at the North American Powertrain Conference last month. And what these are the propulsion experts. These are not people being surveyed. These are the executives at the automakers and the suppliers and the consulting companies that came out and said, look, by 2025 or so, manufacturing a BEV vehicle is going to be the same as an ICE vehicle. And it's going to go below that. They're predicting battery prices of $60 a kilowatt hour by 2030. So costs are going to come down. Prices are going to come down. The industry is going to get better at making these things. And besides, there are rules and regulations in places, especially like China, Europe, California, and probably the Zev states that, I mean, kiss the ice goodbye by 2035. I don't believe that's going to happen, by the way. But that's what the rules on the books are right now. And so if if you're caught with a nice lineup, you're, you're going to be in trouble. But the but the consumer still rules. And, the you know, I, I, th I thought the uh, it was very telling this year when the gas prices went to five dollars a gallon and you got this initial uh, impulse from the Biden administration. Uh, and you're right, John. I mean, all of these automakers are all looking at those. 2026 emission rules and, and they're steep. Uh, but the initial blush from the politicians like Senator Debbie Stabenow and, and Pete Buttigieg was to say, yeah, five bucks a gallon, go buy an electric car. That's what the elites say. But right. then the, the politicians quickly learned that the consumer was not making that pivot. The consumer wanted lower gas prices. And, and so here we are at the end of the year and then Biden and the Biden administration that's beating its chest. You're not hearing from Debbie Stabenow and Pete Buttigieg anymore. Go buy an EV. The Biden administration is beating its chest because gas prices are back down to three dollars a gallon. We did that. Hey, look what we did. We got gas prices back down to three dollars a gallon. They're not talking about uh, uh, people uh, uh, transitioning to EV. So I, I think the uh, I, 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 I agree with you. EVs are going to get better. 
but they're a fundamentally different car for, for a consumer to use. And they, 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 I, I liken the, the, uh, the EV to the old landline phone. You, it, ha- it has to go, it has to wire, it has to go into a wall. It's limited in its range. The gas, the gas car, counterintuitive as this sounds, is a cell phone. You can take it anywhere. All you need is a, all you need is a gallon of gas and you can go unplugged anywhere. So I, I think that's enormously uh, attractive to the consumer. And I, sh- I should point out before the audience goes insane that that Henry actually is a proud owner of a Tesla Model 3 and has it. Raps- <laughs> rhapsodized about this in, in, in many instances. So he's, he's, not, he's not some Luddite who is basically saying, ah, it's not going to happen. No, yeah, um, but also, yeah, let's, let's also 3, keep in three. mind. Yeah, Model 3 is the coolest car I've ever owned. There you go. Jamie. Let's also keep in mind the availability of what's in the market. I mean, yes, consumers rejected the Bolt and the Leaf uh, for their lack of range and size and utility. And yeah, when the powertrain still costs ten thousand dollars more or twenty thousand on a pickup more uh, than a ICE vehicle, it's a it is a high end expensive vehicle, and they're most functional for people who own a home with a garage. But <laughs> We are so early in, in the real development of electric vehicles. I, I mean, like we were talking about earlier, this Ford strategy, you know, Ford jumping the gun with re, repurposed platforms versus, you know, starting with a clean slate. In 10 years, it's just not going to matter, right? Those F-150 Lightnings are going to be replaced by the new F ser- you know, electric F-Series and, and so on. And people will decide what they want at that point. And maybe by then... There's more public charging and it'll be easier for apartment dwellers. I mean, we're getting, we can get to 25, 30%. I think just with the single family homeowners having it as one of two or three vehicles in their family fleet. But yeah, we've got to have the availability exactly. of, of realistic cars. In 2030, I think it's at least one in three new cars sold. Um, you know, look, I, there, there, is, there are things the industry needs to do, though, to, to boost sales. And it's, like right now, it's almost like you need to have charging stations visible everywhere for people to feel comfortable doing this. But what people really need to realize is they're going to live with their car the way they live with their phone. You don't go to the store and desperately in a panic look around for a place to, to hang and charge your phone while you're shopping. Why, why is that? Oh, maybe because it was fully charged when you left the house. Oh, that's what will happen with my car. So, you know, people just need to realize that, that because everybody I talk to, you know, as a journalist, I kind of talk to people all the time just to, you know, sort of cocktail party, you know, baseball diamond surveys on EVs. And so many intelligent people who have a decent job, decent amount of money tell me, I don't know, I don't ever seen one of those in my lifetime. And I'm like, really? Never. Um, in 1985, did you say you would never, never own a cell phone? Because they were really expensive, the service sucked, and they were gigantic. <laughs> and, and now everybody is staring at them nonstop. Why? Because they got cheaper. The batteries got better. You know, I mean, I do remember running around all day and having to find a place to charge my phone because an iPhone 4 couldn't really hold a charge very well. <laughs> um, all that's changing. And like John's talking earlier about the battery cost, that is coming down. You're going to have this interim problem with minerals, battery ingredients, basically. You know, being expensive, but I, I think that will be solved with more development of production and processing. Um, and, and I think the charging issue, it is still, I mean, there is the edge case of the road trip. And even though most people don't take many road trips, they still want to be able to do it. You're going to need to have a system out on the highway. So it's going to be cost. It's going to be accessibility of charging. I think we're going to have to improve the grid to get beyond that, you know, that big, whatever it is, a third of the market, half the market. Um, you know, th- th- there are issues with setting up a charger at everybody's house uh, at the moment in some places. So, but but these things can and will be solved. And eventually an EV is just another powertrain. It's sort of, you know, like manual transmissions are all but gone, sadly. Um, you know, I, I miss them myself, but, uh, you know, there was, there was a time when, you know, a huge part of the market was that. And, you know, these, these things just change and they become part of the woodwork. It'll take time, but it will. All right, so we're coming to the end of the show, coming to the end of the year, and we cannot leave without talking about Elon and Tesla. 
And and I, I, I read an interesting statistic um, on, uh, and I can never pronounce the name of this outfit, Statista, which said on Monday, Tesla's market cap was $435 billion. On January 3rd of this year, the market cap was $1.2 trillion. It lost roughly $800 billion in, in market cap. And that loss is bigger than the combined market caps of Toyota, Volkswagen, Mercedes, BMW, GM, Ford, Stellantis, Honda, Hyundai, Kia, Nissan, and Renault. So how's this all working out with, with Tesla? What, what are we going to see happening in, in 23 with the company? Huh. Hmm. Wow. Are you talking about the, the most unpredictable company and unpredictable executive in, you know, in psh, at least half a century? Um, this is why we have all these smart guys here, including you, Jamie. <laughs> well, you know, all right. Tesla stock is down like two thirds. All the other all the traditional auto stocks are down by 40 percent this year. It's been a worse year for Tesla. It's probably more inflated uh, in the bubble a year ago. Uh, but, you know, the investors have turned hard on autos. I think they've face some of that realization that uh, you can't just uh, snap your fingers to get electric car batteries that and uh, and have customers line up to pay hundred thousand dollars for every one that just isn't the reality that maybe they were all deluded with when they took the kpmg survey and were buying stocks like idiots <laughs> uh so you know i don't know what's going to happen i don't know how long he's going to keep messing around with twitter and whether he's going to whether he's permanently damaging the brand with some of the uh, stuff that he's doing on there, but this, you know, they've got the factories, they're getting their production improved. They will see. I mean, I don't know. There, there's some signs that demand is softening or maybe, maybe some of the incumbents are, are putting a little pressure on, on Tesla. Now they're offering incentives for the first time. Although maybe that's just to keep the feds from getting everyone to delay their purchases until, uh, 2023. But man, I, I can't predict. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, he's 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 certainly uh, one of the most fascinating entrepreneurs we've seen in a long time. It, it's it's impossible, I think, to look at Tesla and not compare him to Henry Ford. I mean, clearly Tesla thinks or Elon Musk thinks about Henry Ford a lot, right? Right down to naming his cars after the uh, original model um, Model T and Model A. And you look at who this guy is. I mean, Henry Ford had his fingers in everything. I mean, the, the, the guy was much more than an auto entrepreneur. Uh, he bought newspapers. He, uh, he uh, influ influenced uh, uh, global policy. Elon Musk uh, is one of those guys. Uh, um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think he's, I, I don't think they sleep. I, you know, the, the guy wants to go to Mars um he he uh he just bought twitter he just he just broke the biggest uh, political dirty trick scandal since watergate he he, he through these uh, journalists uh, matt T uh, taibi in the new york post uh he he uh he's discovered the fbi was uh was was censoring uh, the New York Post over a major election story. I mean, <laughs> all right, Henry. So let's let's move on to cards. No, no, no David. I'm, I'm, David, what do you think? David, no, what but do you think? Listen, Gary. Listen, Gary. This is take turns. This is, this is because yeah, because because this guy decided to spend forty four billion dollars. He, he's now a, a major political influencer. So it's it's hard to uh, you know it's hard to know uh, where where Elon Musk and this and this brand goes um, because he's I think he's he's obviously. Uh, much bigger than just a car guy. So, you know, what, what's hurting the stock? I mean, part of it is the Twitter effect. I think his investors fear that he is completely distracted from Tesla. Uh, but, you know, when, when we had John Murphy from Bank of America, uh, Merrill Lynch at, at the APA, and you know, he predicted that Ford and GM would overtake Tesla in U.S. EV sales 2025, 2026, something like that. I don't know if John's right, but I, 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 I do think some of this is, investors kind of assign some pressure from more EV sales. Look, GM used to have 62% of the market and the Japanese and Germans coming here, even when they took very little in the beginning, still hurt their market share. So Tesla's got what, 70% of US EV market share. I think the incumbent automakers are going to come in and take some chunk of that. And that means the growth slows. And one of the reasons the stock is so high, the company so valued is because it's a hot growth story. When it goes from a hot sto growth story to a lukewarm growth story, your valuation comes down. 
Um, what could stoke that? Um, it's it's not uh, New York Post uh, stories on Twitter. It would be the Cybertruck doing extremely well. And if that's a hit, then this thing, you know, Tesla's value shoots up again. And I think if he actually gets it out the door and there aren't any quality snafus, that probably is going to be a big hit for it. Yeah, John. Uh, I, I, I think it on paper it looks like a pretty good year for, uh, for Tesla 2023. Semi truck is uh, out there. You know, Pepsi's already taken delivery of it. It's going to start ramping them up. Uh, there's good money to be made in class seven and class eight. Very good money to be made. And, and it's likely going to steal share from the, you know, the leader of the pack, which is Freightliner in this country, which is part of Mercedes. Um, also, you know, Giga Factory Austin is is just getting up to line speed right now. Berlin's uh, going to be there too, uh, so there's going to be a lot of cars available to sell. The big problem is Elon and Twitter, you know, and uh, it it's turned into a mess. Remember, you know, he he talked his way into the deal and then he tried to legally to back out of it. I think he recognized he he bit off too much there. Smartest thing that he could do right now is find a CEO to run Twitter and get back to Tesla and SpaceX. And uh, I don't know if the stock is going to go back to the high valuations that it had at the very beginning of this year. It's amazing how much has changed in one year. But I, I, I think that for 2023, uh, Tesla should still be a pretty strong growth story. All right. So, so to, to wrap up the show, I want each of you is 2023 going to be a better year than 2022 or not? So we'll start with you, Jamie. Better year for consumers, better year for suppliers, not a better year for automakers or dealers who have continued to cash in uh, through the undersupply that we've seen during these last, during the COVID times. Uh, you know, I mean, you've seen the numbers, the we basically record profits from the automakers, record profits from the dealers, although they no longer disclose that anymore. Suppliers have been taking on the chin, but that'll that'll improve as production uh, normalizes and standardizes. We'll get more vehicles out there and fewer consumers will have to pay more than the sticker price to get a car from their dealer. Henry. Well, if the, if the uh, economic an analysts are right and they say we're headed into a recession, it's going to be it's going to be a worse year. Uh, can I throw out a prediction here, Gary? Please. So uh, the um, I, I think I think that you know the other piece of automotive that's out there that's a big question mark is autonomous. I, I think autonomous is going to get a huge jolt in twenty twenty three. When the cruise origin goes on the streets of San Francisco, assuming they hit their production targets, I, I, I think I think these these urban markets are 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 ready to go on autonomous. I mean, people I've spoken to who use autonomous services in in Phoenix and in San Francisco love them. And if you get if you get a really good vehicle like the like the uh, cruise origin. Um, I think it could really accelerate um, the game on autonomous subscription services. So mm -hmm. 2023 may be the year when the public starts to realize, oh, autonomous is a thing. Good so, I agree with Jamie's analysis based because look, we're going to see a market of around 50 million vehicles. So better year for vehicle sales, but the impact on profits for those, those various actors, uh, who are a part of that. I think he's dead on. Um, I would add better year for EV sales. I think this is going to be a kind of big year for EVs because you're going to see GM's pickup trucks. You're going to see uh, more EVs from uh, Toyota and some of the Germans. You're going to see real production uh, on the Cadillac Lyric, which I think is, is potentially a big deal for Cadillac. And, you know, later in the year, we'll see the, uh, the Equinox, or price TV, that'll start to test the market and see if mass market buyers are out there. Uh, I think it is going to be a worse year for a lot of these startups because this is not a, an environment where you can raise capital. It was an easy money market for any kind of startup from about 2019 to about 2021. This past year has been tougher and 2023 is going to be horrible. And a lot of these companies are really 
you know, they're, they're, they're shaving pennies and nickels and I don't think they're going to make it. So some of these startups, AV and EV, it's going to be a day of reckoning sometime in 23. Yeah, all good predictions. I, I think it's hard to see 2023 being better than 22. Uh, interest rates are are high. You remember, they were much lower at the beginning of this year uh, than they were. The Fed has indicated it's probably going to keep on raising them because this dang American economy keeps on growing and, and people still are getting jobs and spending money. So the Fed's going to have to try to strangle the economy even more to get in, uh, inflation down. And inflation's very high. That's brooming subpar people out of subprime people out of the new car buying market. So you, you, you put it all together, and I don't think it's going to be better than 22, but I don't think it's going to be a bad year either for the some of the things I just said. I mean, demand for cars is still very, very strong. Uh, the job market is tight as a drum. Uh, the GDP is still growing. Uh, so, like I said, I don't think it's going to be better, but I don't think it's going to be bad. So I'm I'm excited by Henry's prediction that I did not see that coming. And uh, well, I, I think that's that's pretty curious. That'd be cool. Yeah, Jamie, I mean, there's there, you know, it's interesting. You talk to young people, particularly in these cities. And I speak to more and more young people who don't own a car because there are they've already decided. I, I just pay a, an annual subscription to Uber or Lyft, uh, you know, wait. And, and now if now if you get autonomous on top of that. That generation, I think, accelerates that. I, I, I don't. Why, why, why do I own a car? Why do I have the overhead of a car in right. San Francisco, New York, uh, Chicago? And uh, you yeah, know, those are those are big. Those are big youth areas, big youth consumers. Yeah, although we so, talk so, about uh, people's wariness of buying EVs because they want to be able to take a road trip. If you're kind of limited to you know Phoenix and San Francisco, you can't do much of a road trip in that uh, autonomous yeah. cruise, but. The future uh, is wide open. Yeah. You know, speaking of predictions, Dan Ammon, who's no longer the CEO of Cruise, <laughs> told me a few years ago that you know all these companies out there doing AV stuff, it would boil down to a handful or small number. In the same way that you have like you know Apple iOS and Android, and so it looks like we are down to for Robo Taxi anyway, Cruise and Waymo, and then you know and for, maybe Zooks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Zooks is still around. Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, well, Henry they, brought it up. I had to bring it up. Does, doesn't well. Amazon, doesn't yeah, Amazon never heard of it a few years ago and it worked well and they've been, they've been folded into the Amazon system. So yeah. who knows what it'll be. Um, but, you know, and you'll see a couple different companies operating in the trucking delivery spaces, but it really, you know, we, it's, it's a classic shakeout what we've seen in AV. Yeah. Yeah. Real good guys. Probably a good time to wrap it all up. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Jamie, Henry, David, great to have you guys on the show. Great, yeah, great to see you guys. Thanks Happy holidays. Appreciate, yeah. appreciate, your appreciate your time yeah. and your insights. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy New too. Year, all the holiday stuff. And uh, we'll see you all next year. Yeah. See you next year. <laughs> Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Solutions for your journey. If you like this program and would like to learn more about the automotive industry, check out our website at Autoline.tv or look for us on YouTube on the Autoline channel.